Good morning. And welcome to the A. Alfred Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan, one of America's great public research universities. Uh, and I'm learning from Jonathan, both in making that declaration at the beginning of any of our events, but also perhaps encouraging some of those of you lingering at the back and the edges, if you might move up a little bit more to help the energy in the room. It's a bit voidy up here right now. My name is Jeffrey Toon, uh, and on behalf of my colleagues and co-organizers, Maria Arquero d'Alarcon and Martin Murray, it is my pleasure to invite you to join us for the Emerging Urbanisms in Deindustrializing Urban Regions Symposia. The symposia frames discourses emerging from a relational study of four transatlantic urban regions that display acute asymmetries of concurrent growth and socioeconomic decline in the midst of larger economic restructuring. In Germany, the Ruhr Valley or Ruhrgebiet and the innovation region, the Rheinische Riviere uh, surrounding Aachen and Cologne, uh, in the, uh, in the eastern seaboard, the territories and hinterlands associated with Boswash and extending from DC through the state of Virginia, and here in the Great Lakes mega region with specific focus on the Detroit metropolitan region. In each context, successive cycles of urban transformation have created uneven uh, landscapes which consist of fissures, empty gaps, vacated spaces, interspersed amongst and between developed zones with concentrated and thriving activities. The resulting territories are latent sites of contestation and uncertainty where rival actors compete for semblance of control with their own visions of reuse ranging from spontaneous and temporary occupations to deliberate, deliberate and semi-permanent ones. This conversation owes much to Dr. Christa Reicher, who over the past decade has initiated a series of conferences, most recently in 2018 at Zolverein in Essen, where our plans to host this event were first hatched. It also owes an intellectual debt to Michigan's Detroit School and our colleagues, alumni, uh, June Manning Thomas and Margie Dewar, who along with others have propelled and initiated conversations looking closely at the dynamics of surrounding Detroit and its identities, both as a shrinking city uh, and as a space of uneven development. We are thankful for the fiscal support of this event, co-sponsored by the seminar series program at the Urban Studies Foundation in the UK, Taubman College, and the Department of Afro-American African Studies here at the University of Michigan. Um, the effort also forms part of an emerging institutional initiative between the University of Michigan, the University of Virginia, and RWTH Aachen University. I'd also just like to take a moment to thank our incredible staff, Katie Cole, who's the Assistant Director of Events and Public Programs, and Laura Ann Wong, who is our research and creative practice program manager who make incredible contributions to us being able to host and propel these conversations forward. Today's uh, sessions are organized around four, or sorry, five different thematic sessions where we've assembled a diverse group of scholars and practitioners coming from architecture, geography, landscape architecture, cultural theory, urban and regional planning, design, and more. Uh, to engage in these kind of questions, where participants will challenge the notion that all sites of abandonment suffer an identical fate. Examining the four regions as grounds for speculation and a platform for a broader reflection engaging other global geographies, participants will engage in discussions regarding the intricate relationships between the simultaneous incremental erasure of the built environment vis-a-vis -vis ongoing urban projects that instigate appropriate produce and reproduce these weaker vanities while projecting more sustainable futures. So we hope there's a kind of projective dimension to these discussions as well today. I'll draw your attention briefly to the symposia program, which are available at the, at the back, which provide details about each session as well as detailed bios that we'll probably avoid in the introductions um, today for all of our speakers and participants. The morning session will consist of two sessions. Um, one, which you might think we would end with, but we've chosen to tee off with as a way of initiating the discussions around institutional engagements in the transforming city. A second, uh, examining the production of decline. And then at noon, we'll have a box lunch, which is available down these glorious spiraling stairs and north at the end of the building. 
uh, and then get active again in the afternoon at 1245 with a session examining alternative governance models, uh, a comparative discussion around neo-regionalisms uh, in both Germany uh, and in Virginia, and then the final session wrapping up uh, examining design oper operations within these territories. And at six o'clock we have a keynote uh, from Matthew Gandhi uh, from Cambridge University entitled Natura Urbana. So I'd like to just introduce the participants in our first session, Institutional Engagement in the Transforming City. Our aspirations for this were to invite senior leaders from our various institutions affiliated with post-industrial rethinking of cities and transformation to discuss their agendas and aspirations for how academia might lead and support change and initiate a discussion about what roles are appropriate and what aspirations they have as institutional leaders for transforming change within their individual region. Krista Reicher is Professor for Urban Design and Director of the Institute for Urban Design and European Urbanism at the Faculty of Architecture at RWTH Aachen University. Isla Berman, Professor and Dean, University of Virginia School of Architecture. Jonathan Massey, our own dear Jonathan, Professor and Dean uh, of Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. And the session will be moderated by Angela Dillard, the Richard A. Meisler Collegiate Professor of African American Studies uh, and African Studies at the University of Michigan Residential College. So I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Krista, to join us. So thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. Um, so I want to introduce myself not by uh, the work we did in the research, but I want to introduce uh, our institution by a new master program because this master program is the result of our common discussion since nearly 10 years. So now you see that after 10 years, and especially during the last year, we established this kind of master program called Transforming City Regions in the University of Aachen. And the background is going um, to my research at the University of Dortmund and the Ruhr region, where we uh, discussed and um, uh, observed the process of transforming city regions for more than 20 years. What you can see here is how such a region, an old industrialized region, changed during the last years to a new, ch new shape. This is the same site in Essen, which is now a hotspot in the Ruhr region. We did, since 2010, a lot of research on the spatial structure, on mapping the region, on asking people what is their awareness about the region, and at the end, we come out with some strategies for the whole region. But what is interesting for us is to make comparative studies between our region, our regional scale, and the other opportunities worldwide. And this kind of mapping helped us to strengthen the awareness on the specific conditions. Especially to, um, in addition to this kind of mapping, we uh, made several planning projects. Perhaps we participate in this competition called Future of the Metropolitan Region, where we found out that the regional scale, the regional scale in dealing with landscape, is one of the important background for the regional constitution, and this is broken down to the level of the neighborhood. That means, as architects and planners, we have to be, uh, we have to be aware that we have different scales to find out solutions and to make convincing proposals to bring the region a further step forward to a sustainable uh, region and to a sustainable um, landscape. This means this kind of two-scale urbanism or multi-scale urbanism was one of the main 
uh, outcome of our research after having observed all the different layers from the polycentrism to the kind of social and ethnic mosaic until uh, the blue and green infrastructure. And having this done, we organized uh, several conferences. The first symposium and conference was in 2014 and 15 in the Ruhr region. And together with some of these colleagues which are now joining this conferences, a conference we discussed about the specific conditions and frameworks of our region, but also in comparison to the worldwide development. So we uh, defined different questions, different strategies, found out that it is important not only to look at plans, but on the management stra strategy to come to innovation approaches and strategies to develop a region. So this kind of international awareness brought us one step forward in our research, but also in our teaching. And uh, then we continued with different symposia in 2017 in New York and in uh, Jordan. We found out that topics like, like water, like resilience, like public spaces, and also the, the term of urban integration are one of the main issues for uh, a sustainable development of a city and a region. All the outcome would be published in the next weeks in different books. You see that from the starting point of a polycentric city region, now we focus more and more on the topic of integration and the backbone of the city and the region, and the backbone is, for example, public spaces as the common ground. So now, since uh, more than one year, I shifted to another region, to the, um, to the cross-border region between the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, and Germany. And there is a big task, which is called the transformation of the Rheinische Revier. And the expectation is that this brown cold region should be the worldwide showcase of energy transition. To get an idea what is going on, you see the existing landscape, and these areas are now changed into a new landscape, but the expectation is not only to transform the landscape, but to create new jobs, because the economic dimension, the green economy, is one of the main expectations, and we as institute are asked to show the way and to define a strategy for the spatial development of this region and having in mind what does this mean for future and sustainable development. And this is the background for this master. The master, we call it Transforming City Regions. It's a kind of European master program, but since yesterday, I have the feeling it must be named as an international master program and not as a European master program. What are the specific conditions? Uh, we are focusing on an interdisciplinary approach. So the students who started several months ago, they are coming from different disciplines, from landscape, from architecture, from planning, from cultural science, but they have to um, be aware of these skills related to planning. So, and we are focusing not only on planning strategies, but on the environmental, social, technology, uh, technology and economic challenges of the region. And this means that there is a strong approach to look on the dynamics and complexities of the change of our region, but also on other regions. So um, the European Union forced us to establish this program, and a lot of people coming from the European uh, Union are teachers within this program. So there is a strong link between the European context and our school, because our school is situated 
at the most European site. I will speak about it in the afternoon. And then we asked ourselves, what is, at the end, the qualification of these young professionals? So, and to convince our um, ministry to support this master, we said the career perspectives are to qualify these young people as a kind of leader of change. So they know not only the spatial background, the spatial conditions, but they have an idea how do these integrated uh, conditions and challenges work together. And at the end, they have a lot of opportunities to work in the private sector, in the public sector, and in different organizations. Now we started several um, months ago with a small group with 13 students from uh, mostly coming from Europe, one coming from the US. And the main component of this program is the integrated project beside a lot of different core co courses, which you can see here, the core course is, for example, urban transformation, the topic we are speaking today and in the next future. It's also dealing with involving environment or changing societies and economics, because the expectation is to qualify these young people, not only as designers, not only as planners, but those who are aware about um, the complicated and complex background of urban transformation. And it is really linked with the municipalities and the communities in the region. Um, and two days, three days ago, we had the first results of this um, uh, integrated project. And I just want to show you one result which shows that the students are dealing with the different scales, that they understand deeply the, re the reality and the context, and at the end they come up with convincing and understandable solutions. So my conclusion of this, let's say, um, first step organizing and uh, managing this new master program is that it is really important to link teaching and research and practice and the Rheinische Revier and what we would identify during the next days as a kind of common um, uh, basis would be important for this kind of uh, master program and it is really um, necessary to involve the academic institutions into the process design of the real world because otherwise the, the, the distance between, let's say, what is going in in our planning schools and what is going on in the reality is getting too big. And I would also say that urban design institutions are on the one hand a think tank but they have also, on the other hand, to be a big player in the reality, in the transforming uh, region's process. And this is what we do at the moment. And at the end, my last message is we have to combine the local and the global knowledge in a, yeah, in a way, I'm uh, just using this word, a roadmap for transformation, because only on our uh, background on our situation is not enough to create new approaches in urban sustainable development. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Isla Berman, uh, and I'm going to uh, talk about our uh, Next Cities Institute at the School of Architecture. There are, there are many ways that schools can contribute, I think, to the advancing urban and regional transformation. And one of these is by focusing on the opportunities that exist at the intersection of pedagogy, research, and design. 
the Next Cities Institute at UVA was initiated precisely with this agenda to act as an accelerator for design-based research uh, to address complex urban challenges. Uh, things like population growth, uh, shifting socioeconomic dynamics and demographic migrations, climate change and environmental degradation resulting from the overconsumption and exploitation of natural resources and cities that are rendered vulnerable by the fragility of their inherited geographic conditions and also the accelerating transformation of technologies from the industrial uh, to the informational, uh, these things that are fundamentally reshaping our contemporary cities. These and other factors are rendering obsolete our traditional planning techniques while also demanding new methods of urban decoding, new design strategies for prototyping growth, shrinkage and urban transformation, and the invention of an entirely new toolbox of spatial and infrastructural concepts with which to uh, reimagine and redefine the 21st century city. The UVA Next Cities Institute is responding to these issues by capitalizing on the multidisciplinary expertise and capacity of the academy to forecast and shape the vital urbanism of the century as a dynamic platform for research, design, policy, and action, the Institute coalesces existing expertise across the School of Architecture, uh, from architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, and design, in collaboration with key researchers in law, public policy, engineering, environmental science, and data science, among others. In addition to engaging external public and private partners to build a city-focused research and design platform with international impact. The Next Cities Institute is also multi-scalar in approach and is focused on the emerging relationship between three transdisciplinary research clusters in technology, ecology, and society. It acts as an academic think tank to generate impactful best practice prototypes or potentially transferable urban models while also operating as a larger umbrella for a number of project-based faculty-led research initiatives addressing the grand challenges that are facing our urbanizing worlds. So as an overview, I thought I would just uh, briefly present a quick cross-section of a couple of projects that are operating under this umbrella and areas of research that are currently uh, in development. Um, the first, the Yamuna River project in Delhi, India, is a multi-year interdisciplinary research and design project whose objective is to develop longer-term strategies for the city's growth, revitalize the ecology of the Yamuna River in New Delhi, and reconnect India's capital city back to the river. As the city grew and the river was engineered into a drainage system, something that was common uh, to many cities, the city ended up turning its back on the river and this once sacred life-sustaining resource essentially was transformed into a highly toxic garbage-filled sewage canal. As one of the most rapidly urbanizing megacities in the developing world, New Delhi confronts serious environmental, infrastructural, and housing challenges, revealing also the inadequacies in planning, urban design, and social equity. Political leadership, a plethora of disconnected agencies, we did a mapping uh, of uh, the existing sort of governmental structure and who was responsible, is also challenged by its short-term tenure structure and slow-moving bureaucracy when confronted with the speed of change on the ground. And these are unable to operate synthetically and conceptualize a systematic long-term urban vision for the many intersecting needs of the city, which is what our work strives to provide. The project uh, was initiated uh, by capitalizing on the pedagogy and the structure of, uh, of the institution through a series of research studios uh, at the school over a five-year period, and each one uh, builds on the work of the previous and on the research of the previous as opposed to starting from scratch. Um, the methodology begins with research to investigate the causes of Delhi's current situation from many perspectives, 
uh, historic, sociological, uh, environmental, uh, etc., in order to develop a larger collective vision and conceptual framework for the city's transformation. Now this operates in tandem with ongoing faculty-run research that integrates other disciplines while also working with key collaborators uh, such as the Delhi Gel Water Board with whom we have a five-year MOU, uh, working with governance structures, uh, industry, NGOs, and foundations to establish a paradigm for influencing significant remediation policies. Um, and as a follow-up to this project, because the Yamuna River lasted uh, for a, a number of years, we've just uh, uh, started on another territory in India, which is uh, Rajasthan cities, uh, with the first one uh, being Jaipur, and now working with regional government uh, agencies there. Uh, and this is just some uh, kind of sampling of the first uh, stage of the research and related to Rajasthan. Working uh, with city, regional, and national government agencies, which is key to the India work, is also central to a project in Brazil uh, led by Felipe Correa on rainforest cities, a critically important ecological region and complex web of informal settlements comprising 80% of urban Amazonia, one of the fastest growing urban frontiers. Uh, the area, the territory is a highly contested ground between indigenous peoples, extractive enterprises, agribusiness and ranching. Uh, that has received little attention from our disciplines or from designers and planners precisely because of its perception as being non-urban. Uh, the Arctic Design Group, uh, uh, another next city's territory of intense exploration is the extreme Arctic, an area that includes over 5.5 million square miles and eight nations. And this project uh, is led by uh, Matthew Jell and Lena Cho of the Arctic Design Group. Um, and it's also been, uh, like the Yamuna River Project, supported by uh, uh, sequential research studios, each studying a different region of the Arctic. Uh, from Svalbard in Scandinavia to Shishmaref uh, in Alaska. Uh, and the ADG is only one of a handful of efforts worldwide to focus, uh, uh, to foreground design in developing strategies for this future northern frontier, an area whose landscape is being rapidly transformed at an unprecedented pace by global warming, as well as resource extraction and global shipping, rendering the Arctic a highly vulnerable material territory. Uh, ADG's work, which includes the development of an Arctic uh, Urban Sustainability Index, is accomplished within a multidisciplinary academic environment, uh, working also with numerous local and international partners, uh, which are uh, cultural, scientific, uh, governmental, um, everyone from the Anchorage Museum, uh, in Alaska to uh, Krell, the uh, Cold uh, Regions Research and Engineering Lab, to the Army Corps of Engineers. There's a lack of fit uh, between our normative ideas of cities with highly orchestrated patterns of settlement and the distributed, scattered, and informal forms of aggregation that characterize many disconnected cities, towns, and terrestrial outposts of the far north. Indigenous peoples deeply connected with their environment who have survived peacefully in these remote regions for millennia now collide with new navigation channels and workers populating instant company towns there to fuel uh, multinational economic uh, interests. And it is precisely these conditions uh, or collisions, I should say, dynamic environments and ad hoc urban characteristics that enables the Arctic to be a testing ground for us, an experimental laboratory, and also an incubator for a new kind of adaptive uh, urbanism. Um, other key areas of Next City's research uh, includes projects focused on the impacts of data and informational technologies on urban environments. Uh, you'll hear from both uh, Ali Fard and Mona El-Khafif today. Uh, this is from uh, Ali's work. 
uh, and the work that Mona is doing. One specific uh, emphasis uh, that's exemplified in our Main Street 21 project funded uh, by the National Science Foundation Smart and Connected Communities Program is the effect of embedded and portable technologies on the making and organization of cities uh, that also attempts to bridge the urban-rural divide in smart city research through digitally driven placemaking strategies. Uh, coastal resilience uh, is also an important area of uh, NCI faculty research, given that approximately 40% of the global population is living within 100 kilometers of coastal areas uh, and rivers, so that things like sea level rise, coastal erosion, and flooding will impact three quarters of the world's cities and infrastructure. Adaptation will be a monumental task requiring huge adjustments in the location of cities and the construction of new forms of mediating structures. Uh, and here, research is shifting from strategies of control uh, to the modeling of dynamic adaptive systems uh, to mobilize energy embodied in hydrological systems to choreograph uh, the building of coastal lands in an effort to mitigate the effects of sea level rise. And this is a territory uh, that's being led by landscape architecture uh, and uh, Chair Brad Cantrell. And uh, lastly, but most important uh, in relation to the topic of this symposium is work led by Julie Bargman uh, of DIRT and the Regen Lab. You'll also hear from Julie today uh, on the development of regenerative strategies to recycle toxic sites and polluted and degraded land in post-industrial cities and their operational landscapes, the largest wastelands currently on our planet left behind by automation and globalization. The majority of this work is focused on U.S. Northeastern uh, seaboard, the Rust Belt, and also coal mining territories, uh, but also includes cities throughout the global south, uh, such as the work of Felipe Correa on San Paulo, a city with the largest quantity of post-industrial land. Uh, the Regen Lab focuses on transformative urban form that emerges from adaptive design and planning tactics that rebuild resilient economies, repurpose industrialized urban land, and regenerate uh, the intersection between work and place. Uh, we have also started a book series to publish the work uh, through the next cities. Um, and uh, these are the, the first book that has uh, already come out is the one on the Arctic mediating environments, uh, and the next two are on China and New York. Um, but this reimagining of the urban environment through an academic research institute structure allows for the elaboration, simulation, and testing of multiple urban proposal systems and prototypes, a methodology that's only possible within the context of an independent research university acting as a multidisciplinary think tank. And the value of the university in this is primarily in its intellectual and civic freedom and this capacity to engage in what I'll call independent excellence, which remains unfettered by the instrumentalizing utility of the knowledge produced. Uh, and it also has an infinite capacity uh, to combine areas of expertise, therefore developing potentially innovative interdisciplinary connections. In a world where uh, social and economic urban realities far outpace the capacities for governments to adequately respond, and where the freewheeling machinations of global capital that may be responsible for these changes are not necessarily interested in taking responsibility for the larger and often hidden social and environmental impacts, we're likely to see a reorganization and shifting of paradigms as resources become scarce and the ecology of the planet evolves. These will require, in my mind, new institutions and their partnerships, uh, such as academic think tanks, to take on these challenges and the larger project of our future next cities. Thank you. I'll use the lapel mic. Oh, awesome, it's already activated. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks to those of you who have traveled from near and far to join this conversation, whether by presenting or discussing. Um, I had the pleasure of participating in that 2018 
uh, convening in Dortmund and, and was very excited to understand the research happening in this transnational network and to think forward about some of the future collaborations that folks are working on yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm gonna take a slightly different approach. Um, I have just a picture, I mean just one, a title slide. Um, because a lot of my colleagues are gonna be presenting their research over the course of the day, um, I did not, I haven't gathered a research roundup of the kinds that you've just seen. Um, but I thought I would talk about some of the through lines at Taubman College in uh, research in the area of this symposium. So we have a broad range of faculty-driven initiatives in a very kind of pluralistic research culture here. We have uh, faculty who are working in South Africa, Bolivia, China, and Brazil, um, from Benton Harbor, Michigan, to Jackson, Mississippi, and from Ann Arbor to Addis Ababa, often in partnership with uh, other scholars and with governments and advocacy groups on big topics like water systems and coastal management, food systems and the connection to, uh, to other urban networks, and shifting our paradigm from one about transportation and mobility planning to a broader framing of accessibility that encompasses also land use and digital connectivity. I won't try to capture all of that, as I said. One of the through lines in our conversations over the last couple of years has been gathered um, under the umbrella title of Shaping Future Cities, um, a term that emerged out of a symposium we held, uh, I think about two years ago now, that looked at uh, smart city technology and the opportunities and the challenges of an increasingly data and technology-centered economy, governance paradigm, and uh, modes of urban, the production and regulation and use of urban space. And so shaping future cities for me is a little bit of, a, of an umbrella to describe some of that faculty research. There is a, partner, a group called the Urban Collaboratory here um, that operates between the College of Engineering, Taubman College, Architecture and Urban Planning, the School of Information, and works with communities and regions as clients to uh, look at some of the ways Internet of Things, um, censoring uh, data and technology can help answer research questions around uh, uh, provision of services for, uh, for their residents. In, in, in parallel, we are engaged with some radically different actors and approaches to thinking about the future of emerging urbanisms. We have been in dialogue with Sidewalk Labs and the critics of Sidewalk Labs in Toronto, the Keyside development that many of you know about that is testing some of the ways new practices in architecture, planning, design and construction, management, and, and civic data. Um, we've been a, a forum for hashing out some of the tensions between uh, governance and corporate interests in a project like that. We also have faculty colleagues leading something called the Settler Colonial City Project that is focusing our attention on the, on the uh, history of indigenous displacement and the potential for rematriation of land in the US and elsewhere, um, and uh, putting a very different kind of land, land rights uh, perspective into, into the mix of our conversations. And I would say that you know, there's been a lot of focus on Detroit uh, in, in Lester's keynote, I saw him a second ago, um, and in some of the other conversations to come. And so of course Detroit is one of the focalizing frameworks for thinking about these issues. Uh, the college is home to the Egalitarian Metropolis Project, uh, a collaboration with the Mellon Foundation that has supported our high school program, Michigan Architecture Prep, with Detroit Public Community School District. Um, and uh, last night we talked a little bit about the Detroit Center for Innovation, um, an initiative that the president of our university has entered into with, um, with other actors, as, as we discussed. Um, and we also are the, the University of Michigan is also home of the Semester in Detroit program that has articulated a vigorous and incisive critique of the university's ways of entering into partnerships like the Detroit Center. And so for me, I would say if I, wanted, if I were gonna try to situate the urban research conversation at Taubman College, it is in working 
um, across a range of different approaches and especially animating the tensions between them so that we think together about uh, how a region like Southeast Michigan can build its next economy and provide opportunities for uh, employment, uh, health, and education for the people of Southeast Michigan and beyond to combine that with the questions of equity and justice that are so salient in Detroit but, come, but also have universal applicability. Um, and so the, the Detroit School hypothesis, one, one dimension that I've registered in the Detroit School conversation here is the hypothesis that Detroit might offer an opportunity for alternatives to establish neoliberal modes of urban revitalization and redevelopment, and that its spaciousness and it, the heterogeneity of its spaces, the, the leftover spaces included that are at the center of this symposium, that they might provide room for multiple scenarios to play out that essentially offer um, people here and beyond multiple visions for how cities might thrive in the future. The last thing I'll mention is that uh, similar to the master's, the, Krista talked about the master's degree at Aachen. We are working here at Taubman College on a new type of undergraduate degree, a Bachelor of Science in Urban Technology, with the idea that in an age of data and technology driven change, um, in the private sector, in governance, and in advocacy, um, we have the opportunity to draw, to, to center the expertise in urban planning that we have here, combine it with the design intelligence of our architecture community and of other design professionals, and connect it to data science, entrepreneurship, um, and public policy capacities across campus to offer a degree that focuses precisely on the, the, uh, the questions of, uh, of equity and sustainability in a data and technology driven society. We are starting with an undergraduate degree with the aim, uh, with the hypothesis that that might lead us to build up into a master's degree that will um, complement our offerings in architecture and urban planning. So thank you. Hi, again, I'm Angela Dillard. It's um, a real pleasure to, to come up uh, to this side of campus uh, this morning and to spend the day here with a lot of people in a room that I've had the privilege of working with for um, a number of years uh, with the Detroit School of Urban Studies Initiative, um, a 2014, I think it was, conference um, called Turbulent Urbanisms. Um, they tried to gather a lot of people, both locally and internationally, to think about Detroit and Detroit-like cities and kind of what that means and what we might be able to learn and to take from that. So for me, this has been um, a really great experience uh, over the last roughly 10 years and in being involved in a lot of these conversations, watching them come together in such an intriguing way on our campus, um, across the region, um, and then globally, it's really nice to, to, to see so many of you again. Um, so I'm gonna moderate a conversation we have until, Tom check? We have until 10.15 um, to do it. And so while you're kind of formulating the questions that you might wanna ask and to put on the floor, um, and we'll see if we can make them as connected as possible and see if we can get a real conversation going. Uh, as, a, the, as a humanist, um, there's often in the room in a lot of these conversations, um, I think my, que my question, or my version of a question, is always something like, where are the people? You know what I mean? It's, it's a kind of odd thing for me to, 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 to listen in on some of these conversations. It's a little unfair because you all were doing really high level um, kinds of things, but I still think it's, it's a question worth asking, worth having on the floor. And I think it's a complicated question, right? So it's about in, in programs that are about teaching research and practice, how much of that involves community-based participatory research with residents? I mean, kind of what's their role in shaping the perspective and, and what they want and what they need and how they might get it? 
uh, and how governance might work. Um, I think it's about the role of universities. I mean, they, I think it's true in this think tank space. Um, you know, sometimes in political theory, we call universities mediating structures because they sit in between communities and neighborhoods and then high level um, um, governance institutions. But I do think that, that one version of the where are the people is where, where's the accountability? Right? And how do we think through those kinds of complicated questions? Um, so that's some of the stuff that I wanted to get on the table and on the floor initially. Um, I think you know the conversation can certainly go in other kinds of directions. Um, and so that we should kind of immediately, before you all can kind of think about that, but let's immediately open it up to the, the questions that you all have from the floor. And questions that really keep in mind that this is going to be a long day of conversations. Right? So, so what are the initial things that we really want to make sure as a community that, we, that, that we're kind of acknowledging um, up front at the beginning of the day. So I can run around, I can throw this box at you, which is a lot yes. of fun. <laughs> I'm gonna put this down and throw the box. <laughs> Do you introduce yourselves? I'm not really going to throw it at your head, but I'll kind of throw it a bit. Hello. Oh, sorry, it's quite loud. Um, hello, I'm uh, Matthew Gandhi, uh, one of the participants today. Um, I had a question for, for Isla um, concerning the quite extensive use of the um, Batinsky um, aerial photography. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I have quite an ambivalent um, mm -hmm. feeling about some of these aestheticized um, images, and possibly it relates to um, Angela's point about the, the location of people within some of these right. um, images. And I just wondered if you wanted to comment on different vantage points and conceptualizations of these very complex um, urban environments. Oh, am, am I on? I'm like, okay, just wanted to make sure. I know I'm carrying this around, but I, so um, I, I also, uh, even though I love Bertinsky's work, I also have a, um, a troubling issue with the aestheticization of the topics, and I and have uh, thought a lot about it. You know, in terms of how uh, how the material comes forward, and yet at the same time, because it enters into the cultural realm, like the most recent, you know, larger uh, exhibition that was done on the Anthropocene uh, that uh, featured. Uh, his photographs, the one thing that it did was, was bring the publics, and maybe you know, this kind of gets back to the issue, brings the publics into the territory sort of through that venue of culture, um, and, and to introduce them. And, and uh, some of the material that was also sort of part of that larger uh, exhibition, uh, it, it becomes extremely troubling over time you know, when one engages it, but the issue is how to get people to engage it and also engage those territories and issues that are not next door to them. You know, for many, and we could say, you know, that might be the issue for many communities uh, here or in Detroit, let's say, it's one thing when it is part of your community. Many of the things that, that we're dealing with, for example, uh, at UVA, uh, in India or in the Arctic are places that are so remote and yet they are places where the kind of level of um, the level of difficulty, trauma, the impact from what's happening here in this world, you know, those are sort of the unintended consequences that nobody is seeing. The world of the pollution in the hinterlands or in uh, urban territories that are direct result of our lifestyle every day are sort of disconnected from us. Uh, so I think that they're important in that sense in kind of bringing that in. Uh, the other thing that I would sort of add, I mean, they are all, many of them, aerial photographs, right, uh, of kind of large territories as opposed to the thing that you experience uh, as a person sort of on that site. But what that does do is it also, um, 
expands your capacity to realize the extent of some of the complexities, whether it's the sheer quantity of trash, you know, uh, or sewage within a certain context, uh, but it's, it's something that makes you stop for a minute and think, you know, in terms of what we're doing. I mean, the, the photograph of Mexico City, for me, which is not a Bertinsky photo, but is always one uh, that is, that it blows me away every time I look at it, simply because you just see what used to be a kind of mountainous landscape just covered, right, with uh, an, uh, a sort of informal settlement that extends to infinity. Um, and, and that's what we're, you know, that's what we need to somehow be thinking about uh, in order to think about what we're doing sort of every day because we don't make those connections. Is there a follow-up question or comment on this? Maybe tease this out a little bit. Yeah. Oh, toss it. Toss it. <laughs> okay. It only works with undergraduates in a large lecture. <laughs> I'm allowed to scroll. <laughs> yeah, good morning. Mona al Khafif, also from UBA School of Architecture. Um, I just wanted to comment a little bit to your question because this exhibition that was um, about the Anthropocene featured in Toronto, um, I think the strong part of these photographs is actually that it connects the individual and the person to the drama that is happening globally. And I think these are the two scales that are somehow discussed widely. What is happening on the planet and what are all the effects of the individuals acting on patterns of consumption and what are the consequences maybe in the global south of these effects. And it's extremely important, I believe, that this is communicated to the public. And I remember some comments in the exhibition actually and the Rhine Revier was also featured and it was very interesting to see how people reacted to specifically this picture because it was featuring the big cranes and how they are taking out the brown coal and it was a monstrous scale, like it looked like a moon landscape and everyone was uh, basically taking down Germany and I was standing there being a good old German thinking wow, this country, Germany, is actually doing a lot to transition from one, from the dirty energy to the green energy. So what is really truly missing in these kinds of exhibitions is the, are the different scales that are actually happening in between. And I find that's also the, it's really important when we bring up what's the interest of the individual, when we think about community engagement, et cetera, what is really the need of the individual and what is the concern of humankind to some degree. And for me, the most important scale is actually what's happening in between and how we can stitch these scales together. I'm throwing this. I think Margie had a hand up. Could you toss it back to Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't hurt if you can. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Margie Dewar from Urban Planning at the Taubman College. And um, I was sitting here thinking about how do you make something happen in mm -hmm. the world? with this work. Yeah. Here we have a big emphasis on engagement, engagement to do work with partnerships, with um, decision makers, policy makers, or whoever, who can actually then implement some of the knowledge that's coming out. Otherwise, we kind of seem like, well, we're talking to each other, but not necessarily changing world problems. Yeah, I want to, I'm, I'm Robert Fishman from the Taubman College. I want to fo follow up on what Margie was saying, maybe in a little more pointed way, since I'm not a, I'm an historian rather, rather than a planner and architect. But uh, historically, you know, the, the, the point of connection between academic knowledge and communities has been uh, the, the urban planning structure especially you know, plan, regional planning commissions, uh, city planning, and so on. Uh, I think that something that what characterizes our present moment, I think not only in the United States, but throughout the world, has been essentially the collapse of that kind of bureaucratic approach, which never worked terribly well at any time. And I think leads, uh, you know, leaves this you know, question that Margie was raising, uh, what if 
our knowledge, you know, our knowledge develops in such a wonderful way uh, within the university, and there's just no transition be transmission belt to uh, the people, the neighborhoods, the cities that we need. So I guess I would, you know, in terms of putting things back on the, on the panel, I would challenge them, where do you see that kind of transmission actually happening? You're doing a great job developing this interdisciplinary knowledge. Where do you see this transmission happening? I think Krista should answer that question <laughs> yeah. first. So let me, let me give uh, some comments on what, we, what I've heard and uh, to the different questions. First of all, I understand um, our role as university as, and institutions in the field of planning not only as a kind of innovative think tank, but as a kind of, yeah, making things, let's say, visible and bring them to the street. And this means in detail that we have to look to whom are we addressing what message and at what point are we involving people. For example, when we are working in the different villages in the Rheinische Revier, we can communicate directly with people who are involved in the whole process. But when we are designing, let's say, regional guidelines, it's not possible because this is a design or let's say a proposal which is really a little bit too abstract. And in this case, we are uh, organizing workshops together with um, people who are working in the planning authorities, who are responsible for the fir formal development plans. So according to the scale, to the local scale, to the city scale, and to the regional scale, the concept of participation and involving people should be different. You cannot say participation is one strategy. It has to be a really detailed, organized, and addressed strategy. So in the field of the Rheinische Revier, now our task as institute is, um, on the one hand, to organize a process how should the planning strategy for the region be designed as a kind of process design for the next three years. This means you have different layers. You have to um, propose a concept of participation. Yeah? Whom should you, at what time, at what point, involve? in your analysis, in your, let's say, strategy of an integrated process. And on the other hand, you have to solve one important problem, and this important problem is we have a formal regional planning strategy, and what we are doing is an informal, an informal way of planning, but the informal way has a big advantage that you can go into detail on the local level and show what, for example, means to create a village of the future together with the people or to involve people in new um, urban <coughs> factories, new um, um, yeah, e economic uh, approaches in the region. If it will function, I don't know, but the idea is um, to develop this kind of process design together with colleagues which are responsible for economics, for um, let's say ecological issues, for agriculture, for new forms of energy, uh, and for example, um, one pillar is organized in the, in the whole topic of um, education and innovation. So you have to work together with others, but combine the different um, layers and scales and define a process of communication so that people are not frustrated because they know that in two or five years their job in the coal um, mine uh, will not exist and they are worried about their future. So to make them, let's say, con convinced that this new approach of creating uh, 
a, a green economy is the only possibility uh, for them, and this should be linked to a kind of livable landscape and livable region. I know it, it sounds a little bit abstract, but I have the feeling it's the only way to, to make this big step and um, to come to, yeah, to a vision which has a lot of question marks, but uh, I don't know an answer to, any, if, if to every I, question um, mark. If I link your, your question, Robert, back to Angela's prompt, um, one, of the, one of my core understandings of the University of Michigan is that as a public research university, it has really multiple accountabilities. It's, we are formally governed by a board of regents elected by voters of the state of Michigan under a 200-year-old under a charter. Um, we're also accountable to, because uh, decades of disinvestment in, in public funding for education um, have diminished our ties to, um, the, uh, to state government, we nonetheless are still accountable to uh, the state legislature for a significant portion of our budget and for um, certain other kinds of support. We're accountable to current and prospective students who, who uh, through the university's governance and budget model, uh, really drive a lot of decisions about academic offerings th as they, as they um, choose how and whether to enroll in our, our degrees. And then we're accountable to funders of many kinds, uh, foundations, research agencies, um, and uh, philanthropists. And um, it, when I think about the specificity of what urban research is happening at Taubman College, I think that's where some of the civil society advocacy and government accountabilities are especially pronounced. You, you did suggest that the planning agency as a, as a channel is, is weaker than it used to be. But when I think about what, what people at Taubman College are doing that does translate back into direct communities, I think about partnerships with the One Mile Foundation and Oakland Avenue Urban Farm in Detroit. I think about w faculty who are working with the city of Ann Arbor on housing affordability, who are working with the city of Detroit and its planning department to, to test ideas about neighborhood planning strategies, who are working formally with the city of Benton Harbor. Um, I think actually we, a lot of our faculty uh, you know, the Michigan Coastal Commission. A lot of our faculty are actually working through exactly those channels that, that may not be as strong as they used to be, but are, I see them very active in what faculty are if doing. I, I know we're nearing the end, but if I could add just one more uh, piece, because I think uh, we, part of our role is actually dealing, in some cases, with, with broken systems, right? Uh, and for uh, the rest of the world that doesn't work as well as Germany does in relation to uh, relations to government bodies uh, and academic institutions, I wanted to use the example from India with the Yamuna River uh, project because I think that um, many of these have to do with setting up multiple partnerships. Uh, the NGOs become particularly important in relation to linking with communities. Uh, we do a lot of, let's say, smaller scale projects where community engagement happens in a one-to-one -one way with faculty sort of on the ground with communities. But we are not experts at, uh, and at dealing with communities in that way. And it's really important that we're also bringing in people who have that kind of knowledge and understanding, but who are also on the ground and dealing with those communities every single day. Um, and uh, at the other level, uh, we're working with government agencies, et cetera. So uh, we have somebody specifically working on that project who is, uh, who is from uh, Delhi, who lives in Delhi, and, uh, and his role on the project, he's also a grad of UVA and an architect uh, there, uh, but his role is to facilitate the connections. Uh, and so one of the issues always, and one of the questions is always, well, why should we, let's say, as an academic institution uh, in the States, be working on a project there as opposed to uh, India dealing with those issues themselves. And the point is that so much of it 
uh, is absolutely seen from uh, on the ground as being the problems are so large and so intractable that nobody can even find a place to start. Uh, and what we do through this process uh, that is also very public in the sense that all the work is not only given to the city, but we have exhibitions and symposia there and bring in all the ministers, the minister of water, uh, the lieutenant governor of New Delhi, the prime minister, I met with the president of India, and it is part of finding a way to move some of this forward. Um, so I think it's, we don't have the kind of solutions in terms of the larger structure, but I think that's one of the things that we should be working toward uh, as a design challenge itself. So we're going to need to, to wrap up, um, but I think the challenge is going to be to take this conversation in which we started with institutions and these projects and then tease these, these themes out over the course of today. I mean, some of the things for me were certainly this kind of where, where are the people, which is who do you partner with, how do you think about the institution in relation to um, actual communities, how do you deal with tricky notions about accountability. I mean, we all know that institutions are not one thing. They, they work against each other. They pull against each other. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a wild and wooly um, kind of environment. I think one of the other big themes was the you know, connections between the global and the local and teasing that out and really thinking about what those might mean and how we think about it. I also thought I heard kind of how interdisciplinary is interdisciplinary enough? And so who else has to be at the table and in the room as we're thinking about these projects and how they might play out? Um, I also thought I heard in the presentation something really interesting about um, Detroit-like cities, which are shrinking cities, because I've learned this over the years and kind of working with my colleagues. Um, cities for whom it's not the, the urban but the regional, and then megacities as something to really kind of think through about, you know, connections and difficulties across, and, and similarities across those um, things. And I also think um, part of what I heard, part of what I think needs to be in the air and, and, and on the floor at the beginning of, of the day, we always say this when we're thinking about Detroit school stuff, that you can't talk about Detroit and not talk about race. Uh, you know, and, and deep inequalities and brokenness of systems that then impact and are impacted by these deep inequalities around race, ethnic conflict, class conflict, competing interests in these projects. Um, and so we really want to make sure that that kind of gets on the floor early on for us and that we're thinking with that as well. And with that, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thanks.